Welcome to the Lord's First United Methodist Church, the second Sunday in August, Sunday morning worship service, and it's the year of our Lord, 2020, and it's the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. Especially, I'd like to welcome those who are visiting with us and worshiping with us today on YouTube and Facebook, and I um, hope you will enjoy this and will be edified by what takes place today. Also, a special Thanks to Carrie King for uh, operating our technology today. Uh, this is our first time. Pray for her. We're very proud of her. Eric's on vacation. Also thankful for Rose Davis ministering to us in music. And also Mrs. Carol Maruk Ramadi, who's our liturgist today. I'm very thankful to have them leading us and helping us in our service today. And so we just uh, pray that uh, everyone who is worshiping with us today, we will receive a very special touch from the Holy Spirit as we worship, as we pray, as we sing, and as the word is proclaimed, that you will draw closer to God and that God will be glorified. Our call to worship consists of two scripture passages. The first is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 6, from the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The second scripture reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verses 16 and 17. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let everyone who hears say, come, and let everyone who is thirsty come. Let everyone who wishes take the water of life as a gift. Our invocational prayer is from Psalm 17, verses 1 through 9 and 15. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Guard me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. Amen.
Testament scripture reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 5. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that do not know you shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Okay, we now come to the time in the service when we'd like to share the joys and concerns. And first, our joys. Uh, our blessing box continues to help people in the community be in the hands and feet of Jesus in the community and we continue to be very abundantly supplied as far as canned goods and different foods and financially. We're very thankful for that. Also, the pastor's emergency fund continues to help people at this time with bills and medical bills and things like that and helping the needy. And of course, we know that's what Jesus wants us to do. Also, the uh, COVID-19 virus at the nursing home right behind the church, which at one time had the 47 positive cases, has now declined. The last I heard was zero. And uh, so we're very, very thankful for that. And um, also, our church ministries has continued during this time to be sufficiently funded with tithes and offerings and we're thankful for that and just like to remind folks that our offerings are a method or way of worshiping also and um now we'd like to share some concerns uh billy and pat harris need your prayers and they are dealing with a lot of different things also denzel and karen suggs need your prayers it's the same situation there they have a lot coming at them and they need your your prayers and support Don and Sandy Padgett are, Sandy's recovering from surgery, and Don is a few things that he's recovering from, and um, so just keep them in your prayers. Also, uh, John Brown has had some surgery, and we uh, would like for you to remember him in your prayers. And also, uh, I have a friend, Jack Grimes, who was bitten by a cottonmouth uh, snake here about a week and a half ago, and he was in very serious condition in ICU in Georgetown, but seems to be doing better. Keep him in your prayers. Also, a good friend of mine, David Morris, uh, had some serious surgery here the other week, and he needs, he's doing well. He, we request your prayers for him. Also, uh, we have here um, several other people. Uh, Ms. Daphne Newman, who broke her arm, uh, who's a good friend of mine. And then um, our shut-ins, Edie Befford and Francis Conyers, they need your prayers and support. Uh, we all know at this time that shut-ins are very can be, be very lonely, and of course, a lot of us with this uh, staying at home and not getting out the way we used to know that sometimes this loneliness can, can be visited upon all of us. And so, phone calls and cards and things like that are very important at this time. Also, in the Lord's nursing home, Isabel Gibson, Joe Sutherland, and Joan Taylor are in the nursing home over there. And uh, <clears throat> Joe and Joan have recovered from the COVID and are now testing negative and so we're very very thankful for that also this pandemic that has stricken the world and our country 
uh, continues to in many ways march on. There has been some positive reports, but we know that we're still sort of under the gun as far as that's concerned. So let's pray for our world and our nation. Also the civil unrest that is taking place in our country. Let's be in prayer for this situation, that people will come to God and seek his forgiveness and learn to love one another. And also we know, especially those of us who live close to the coast, that we're in a hurricane season and there's a hurricane that's sort of sneaking up the coast. And uh, we just want to pray that, uh, that people will be spared and that God will help us to find ways to minister when and if it does hit. Okay, so those are our concerns. And so uh, we'll now have our uh, call to prayer. Let us pray. Merciful Heavenly Father, during this time of extraordinary difficulty, please give us perspective and patience. May we who are merely inconvenienced remember those whose lives are in jeopardy, those who are sick and those who have lost loved ones. May we who are not most at risk remember in prayer those most vulnerable. May we who have the capacity to be with and care for other family members during this time remember those who feel desperate because they have no one to lean on. May we who have merely had to forego the cancellation of activities Remember those who have no place to be or no place to enjoy. May we whose incomes have dwindled remember those who have no sustainable income at all. May we who can socially distance in the safety of our own homes remember those who have no home. As Fears and frustrations grip our country. Let us choose love and kindness. Help us to find ways to be the loving embrace of you, O oh God, to our neighbors. Help us to distinguish between needs and wants, between enemies and those who simply hold different points of view. Give us patience and respect toward those who are sincerely trying to do the right thing and the courage to be bold role models for those who are not. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our New Testament scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men, women, and children. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, it's interesting how you prepare a sermon and you try to think about things you might say, and then sometimes something else comes out to you right at the last moment. That beautiful song, Shards of Glass, that just fits so well, the sermon of the of the Five Thousand, how God can just, Jesus could take things and do wonderful, mighty things with it. But also, as I was looking around, and you see these stained glass windows, my understanding, it's been a while since I've interacted with the material, but stained glass windows got to start in the church back in about medieval times, or way back a long time ago, when they took broken glass that had been shattered, as our lives sometimes have been shattered, put it together, and noticed that the sunlight, when it shined through, created a very special, holy kind of aura. Okay? And that's kind of the beginning of stained glass windows. In fact, it would be interesting to take each glass window and do a series of sermons on it and what's on there. So that's an idea for the future. And then um, another thing is, like a lot of times when I'm um, working on sermon things, um, some things come to me, uh, I kind of wander a lot of different places. And uh, I notice, I've always liked the Hubble telescope and anytime anything comes over about any pictures that have been taken in outer space. And I came across something that said the Andromeda galaxy, which has about a trillion stars. It's about 2.5 million light years away. And the Milky Way galaxy, which is maybe a little bit bigger, is on a collision course in about 4.5 billion years. Now, one thing's for sure, the world is gonna to come to an end the world and the universe that God created is going to have some very drastic changes. And Jesus, I think, will probably come before the end. But you just have to remember that God created this universe and he's in control of all things. And this kind of just makes a point to me of marvel as I look at the universe and I see all the different things that go on and transpire and are going to transpire. And uh, so... This story of the feeding of the 5,000, there was also another story of the feeding of 4,000. It was different, um, but it was the same. It was a miracle. Uh, this is a story. It's a true story. It's not a parable, but it's actually something that happened, the feeding of the 5,000. It's important to note, background, that this story, the feeding of the 5,000, appears in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I think there's a reason why. Because, you know, God wants us to learn from all the things in the Bible, and every word in the Bible is 
Holy Spirit inspired. But I think when something appears about four times, it's like you need to pay attention and study a little bit closer. And, uh, and also keep in mind that 5,000 men, women, and children, that, that means there were probably 5,000 men and then probably, if you figure, if they were all married, which I don't know, but women and children, it was probably more like 10,000, okay? But sadly, back in those days, men were considered to be more important. And we've talked about that before. Now, Christianity uh, definitely calls us to, to see the importance of, of everybody, Jew, Greek, male, female, and the little ones and things like that. So uh, with that in mind, what I want to do is... Uh, I want to read the passage out of John, which is the same as the one that was read out of Matthews, but they're very, very similar, and, uh, and that I think it's important to go over it again. It says, after these things, and of course, uh, that was after he had heard of the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. After these things, Jesus went over to the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them. That every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. So Jesus gave a command there, and there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled the twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the sign that Jesus did, said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. And therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to a mountain by himself. It's the feeding of the 5,000, a wonderful, special, special miracle, mighty act of God. The feeding of the 5,000 is a story of God, and Jesus, the Son of God, turning scarcity into plenty. It's a, a story of Jesus showing compassion and mercy to those who were in need. Okay. And it's a story that uh, it, we, we, we need to pay very close attention to what was going on in the context of what was happening. Because there was a message to the folks then, and it's also a message to those, those of us who are living in these times. God's word spoke and is spoken to those then, and we need to understand what it's saying to us now. You see, something had happened that really was troubling Jesus and hurt him very bad. King Herod was having an affair with Herodias, and John the Baptist, his cousin, his messenger, had called them on their behavior. And uh, that guy, Herodias, kind of angry, and so she, King Herod had promised Herodias on her birthday he, she, he would give her anything she wanted. Well, she asked her daughter to ask the king for the head of John the Baptist. So the disciples, uh, they, when they buried John, they went to Jesus and they told him what had happened. So Jesus did what in his humanity was normal to do and what we would do when we had our heart broken and been shocked. And I think many of us have had these kinds of things happen in life, similar. He withdrew to be with his feelings, to think, and to pray. And this is what happened that Jesus foretold in many ways, the suffering that he was going to go through. So, what happens, though, 
is what Jesus does. He gives us an example. And he, out of his hurt and his pain and his heartache, did what he was called to do. The Son of Man came to serve, not be served, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what he did was he took and instead of withdrawing from the crowds, he went back and he told his disciples to do something, okay? So don't turn them away. Hmm. And the disciples, well, they were kind of like, now wait a minute here, okay? I mean, this is kind of an impossible, difficult situation. And how do we, how do we, how do we do this? And, um, and I think that uh, we, can, we can understand this is where Jesus identifies the Son of God who was without sin and he was God in the flesh, still identified with us in the flesh and that his compassion was sort of maxed out or at least what he tested very much. But he had compassion upon them and um, he had ministered in so many ways that quite often when we minister to people it seems like that God continues to put more and more upon us and on our plate. Life has a way, when you're following Jesus, to never really be calm and easy. Life has a way of different things, different people and situations of intervening and placing uh, situations and, and people and different things on your plate that are inconvenient. And we're taxed and we have to Remember that as Christians, we are called to do something, do something. Jesus told them, give them something to eat. They said, we don't have it. How do we do this? And Jesus said, bring to me what you have. Do something, bring to me what you have. So they found this little boy and he had with five bottle loaves and two fishes. And they brought it to him. And then Jesus took and blessed it and passed it out. I would have liked to have seen that. I don't know if that's you. But truly, it, was, it would have been most overwhelming. Give them something to eat. You know, Jesus, he didn't expect his disciples or us to do, and he doesn't expect us to do miracles on our own. He expects us to bring to him all that we have. Okay? Everything. Even though it's not a whole lot. You know, these disciples, they saw 5,000 and then some uh, problems. And what Jesus saw was 5,000 opportunities and solutions. But he didn't expect the disciples to do it on their own. He wanted to work with them and that's important to understand that that's what God wants us to do, is to, is to work with Him. He wants to work with us. He wants to reveal His power to this world and His might and His Holy Spirit through obedient Christians and people who are willing to take Him at His word. You know, there is a hunger problem in America. Actually, they say the more people in America, even though we're considered to be very blessed, and a lot of people want to come to America, then there aren't a lot of other developed countries. Now, the undeveloped countries, the, the, the hunger and the poverty is, is, is just, just mind-boggling. But the truth of the matter is, is there's a lot of people who are really needy. And so there's plenty of opportunities for us to reach out. But we become exasperated because we feel like we pay taxes, we feel like we give and we help. But it seems like there is no progress that are made. It is being made. But it's important to realize that no matter how daunting the task may be, how frustrated we may get, Jesus wants us to do something. He wants us to do it in his name and in his power and come to him. And he will find a way and he will do what he is going to do. Mm -hmm. I think our church, we have our pastor's emergency fund that we help people with the bills and the medical bills. We have our... Uh, Helping Hands, Helping Hearts, and we have a blessing box, which is it transpires every Friday from 4.30 to 6 o'clock, and we make a difference in the community, and it's really good that we do that. But you see, there's something else that's more important, in many ways, it's, 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 it's more important, and that is, is that while John Wesley said that he knew no holiness without social holiness, we need to understand that 
while people have physical needs, and we as Christians need to meet them, and we need to do it in the name of God, to glorify God, and let God work through us, it's important that we see that there is a spiritual hunger and thirst after righteousness. In Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. You see, not only should Christians hunger and want more and more of God and righteous things, but we should hopefully through the enlightenment and the power of the Holy Spirit understand that what the people really need and what Jesus really moved Jesus was that they needed a shepherd. They needed hope. They needed encouragement. They needed something, someone. And what they need is God. And if people can find God, then many people are able to take a meager existence or a modest existence and become extremely very, very There have been some times when I have been, okay? He does this, so he allows it to happen. miracles through us in many different ways, in many ways that we would not expect. Many times we conclude that something can't be done, so we don't bother trying to do it. We become, I guess it's called paralysis of analysis or something like that. People talk themselves out of doing it, okay? I've seen that. I've done that. Sure have. And, um, but and another thing is in, John God, in John's Gospel, as it is read to you, it tells us that Andrew found a young boy with five loaves and two fish. Another message here is don't dismiss the small things in life. God used this young boy. He used the tears of the baby Moses to attract the attention of the Pharaoh's daughter who saved him from sure death. Okay? Mm -hmm. He, one of the things, if I could go back in time, and there's probably a lot of things I'd like to be able to watch that took place in the Bible times, just go back and watch. It was David and Goliath. On one side you have Goliath and all those Philistines just lathering at the mouth, waiting to see him just devour this little boy. And the Israelites, knees knocking. <laughs> and David takes that stone. God put him there. Young boy, most people say he's probably about 16 or 17 years old. And, um, and he took him out. And then God called a young maiden, Mary, to uh, bear Jesus and bring him into this world. And I, scholars think she was just a young girl, 14 or 15 years old. See, when God demands, he supplies. He's Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. He will always provide. He'll do it in some ways that will really befuddle us. I mean, why did Gideon? Gideon thought he needed thousands of uh, men to defeat the enemy. And guess what? He ended up with 300. And that was to show Gideon and others that God was the one giving the victory. So, some object lessons here is this. Is the fact that something is impossible is no excuse for not doing it. God asks us to do the impossible and then gives whatever we need to obey his command. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. And when we give our all to God, our whole self, all of our resources, we discover that the impossible is not or isn't. With God, all things are possible. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine with the branches. If you abide in me, I will abide in you. Without me, you can do nothing. Now, some people have probably heard this, but one of the things that has really impressed me about this passage of scripture is that 
when Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, the first meal on the moon was Holy Communion. Buzz Aldrin was an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and the elements had been consecrated. And they, as their devotion, used that passage, John 15, 5. And without me, you can do nothing. The message I see there is that here are two men, astronauts, fighter pilots, degrees in aeronautical and mechanical engineering, very gifted. They had it. They would have the right stuff. But they were on the moon. They accomplished something that no human being had ever done. And yet, this passage of scripture, without me, you can do nothing, okay? two fish to feed over 5,000 people. It originally just seemed like not enough. But it's important to understand that in Jesus' hands, our meager resources and talents, if we'll give them to him, he will do marvelous and wonderful things. And he, we will be able to make a difference in this world. And believe me, at this time, now more than ever, we need to allow God to feed us and let the good shepherd lead his dear people, his dear flock along and trust him completely and hope it. Because this world needs that. They need to see our example and they need the Holy Spirit in their life. They need hope and encouragement. And that's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. We will now have the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
the presence of God, a peace that overflows, and the word of God, the seed that you might sow. Amen.